Good morning. It is Saturday morning. It is out of rock o'clock. Hi. Um, welcome to the lounge. It's always a lounge. Please join us every Saturday here. Ah, on Angel Spitz Twitch. I know Saturdays are not easy, and I apologize for that, especially this hour, everything. Um, and we're going to talk about rock and roll and making music and awesomeness and get caffeinated here. My computer is really not being kind to me today, but that's fine. This is brought to you by Angel Spitz Patreon. Supporters are here. Even if you're not a supporter, you're absolutely welcome. Uh, three bucks a month, and you help keep me going and deal with streaming issues like this, but... That's just it. Angel Spitz's new album is called The Bastard Gods, and it is kickstarting now. And I release the album artwork and a whole bunch of the merch gets officially mentioned this week, and it looks awesome, and I'm really, 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 really happy with it, and it's going to be very dark and screwed up in the brain because that's how I like it if you like other things dark and screwed up in, in the brain you need to follow this uh, Spotify playlist it's called Industrial Incisions and there's a whole bunch of really cool bands Rezzy you need to send me a track by the way and Ivan have you sent me a track yet? great Rezzy send me a track Um, it's new stuff and also golden oldies and awesome favourites so check that thing out it's bloody awesome also, amazing music to check out is MTV TV. After this, we are streaming to MTV TV because it's Trey Bomb, which is French for pretty good. Pretty damn good, actually. Uh, and if you got a video, send it to them at that email right there, and they will play it. Welcome to the Art of Rock. We're going to talk about vocoders. Uh, and we're going to talk about wherever the conversation leads us, but I want to talk about vocoders. I want to talk about cool tricks with vocoders. I'm throwing the floor open. Go. Okay. Well, firstly, tell me about what you do, because you've been doing this a long time. And so, you know, for you to say, and then I'm going to throw it to you, Rezzy, because I know you're going to have some crazy thoughts. But Ivan, I have a suspicion that you may have some cool tricks, because you've been doing this for, like, since 1875. So tell me amazingness of Trey Vakoda. This might be a... This might be a... Uh, what I'm using bro it just I just I just can't get an acceptable sound out of it okay and I've been like system eight as you know a mic in and can be a vocoder right but I I am so too lazy to set up hardware to to use the hardware to do that um at the same time uh yeah, I think uh, I think I've got a track where I'm actually running, like the one of the drum tracks through the vocoder to do vocody stuff to the drums, and it, it yeah I I think that's probably the one place where it, 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 I'm happy. Um, awesome, man! I'm having horrible internet. Are you doing cat today. stuff? Sorry, no, no, I'm throwing my jacket off. I'm doing the slow strip. Yeah, we got a little bit of little bit of lag and talk over, right? Yes. Apologize. Um, it's uh, I, not I to do... mention my terrible audio from from. <laughs> yeah, you're not your usual sexy Go. boomy self. Um, yeah, I apologize. My web is absolutely dog shit right now. Thank you, Ivan. That was helpful. Um, I uh, Razzy, do you have any tricks with Vocodor? No, um, I like where Ivan was going with it, though. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, I got my Yaya's doing a couple of tracks with vocals being the modulator and a big synth pad being the character back in, um, uh, I don't know, the 2000s, whenever the first software emulations of vocoders came out, because who can afford a big piece of Moog or 18T 
technical hardware to do the real job. Um, there's that Pia kit that was contending that I think was a clone of a Mogo coder that I almost got, but I didn't get into doing um, that kind of effect until software emulations were available. So it's a little bit not as... Well, whatever. You can do the expressive stuff. But mainly, Carrier is a big synth pad, buzzy, raspy, and then the uh, modulator is a drum track or the entire bus from the drum or just the kick and snare or something like that. And, you know, do something cool and rhythmic. And um, you can affect the the envelopes and, and the, the um, amount of time that it takes from the excited band to taper off to get different sort of sustain effects. Uh or more percussive and staccato effects from the same sustained pad. Um, but it is, you know, hey, I'm all into harmony being very present in, in the in the song arrangement. So doing something rhythmic to that harmonic progression is uh, pretty fun. Maybe I'll do it again sometime. I haven't touched a vocoder in quite a while. I'm going to try this and... This nasty bastard with... With a chip change, will make a very nice vocoder, and I, I should probably just re-chip it because I've got them. Dude, and the red's a, a classic. Try. You it, use it, it was right? Featured in, yes. It was featured in oh, what? Oh, this is a rotor machine. It was featured on Bad Gear, and you know that video. That video by itself was enough. To, I was just like, yeah, I'll have one. So I went out and went out and grabbed one. It was, it was like hundred and fifty bucks. Yeah, for for this amazingness and you know, it's great. I, I love this piece of hardware. Um, do it a thousand times. Do it. Okay, can I have a rant about Fakotas and why they are fantastic? One, <laughs> if you get a chance, there's a um, YouTube video about how they achieve the uh, Cylon voice for Battlestar Galactica, and in my humble opinion, that is the greatest Fakota sound ever. Uh, they used an EMS vocoder, a 3000, I think, maybe a 5000, and it's just pure balls. Um, in a nutshell, what you want to do is compress your vocals and compress them pretty damn hard. Do not multiband the vocals because you need uh, frequency variance across the spectrum. Multiband is going to push everything up, so it's going to lose its effect. Two, um, don't distort your vocals, have them clean. Um, you can put reverb, if you want to use your vocals in a pad, definitely compress the crap out of them, but and then run them through reverb. And that reverb vocal, when it goes through a vocoder, is going to string draw things out. So it's going to sound really pretty, like Rezi, you were mentioning the decay, it's going to do something like that. Um, same rules apply if you're using drums. Uh, compress, da 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 da. Next, um, depending on the vocoder you are using, you need to be very uh, aware of the input volume. For some, uh, for some machines, um, driving it a little hard, like if it's analog, driving it a little hard works. For others, it does not. Um, for some, the warmness will bring up frequencies. For others, it does not. Uh, the dope for Vakoda, which I'm fortunate enough to have, you drive it, and it just sounds like gloss. So, rule of thumb is the input wave, uh, modulator <coughs> wave, compress. Um, and I'll compress it in my computer, uh, and then I'll drive it to a hardware compressor, then drive it in the mo uh, modular. The reason I do that is I've got um, extra volume. I can boost stuff up by 20 dB on my hardware compressor. Um, and I can also <clears throat> just clamp it down a little more. You can't compress vocals enough. Um, so if I, if I want to ride the, um, the volume here, uh, I can do that. Next, the carrier or the synth pad. The trick with the carrier is you want something to have um, as much uh, frequency spectrum as you can get. Um, so a great big buzzy chord. Uh, I actually, 
I don't know whether, you know, experiment with chorusing it and reverbing it and all that jazz. Um, if I'm doing a massive vocal sound, I will do uh, unison coming out of the profile, uh, the Rev 2. Um, once again, I'll drive that into the uh, into a physical compressor because I can control a whole bunch of stuff and then um, run it out of the compressor. Actually, what I do is um, I've got a um, an old-fashioned graphic EQ, like a you know three slider per octave, good old-fashioned like piece of crap that you can get for free now and they are so much fun man if you want really cool pads run your pads through them and real time change stuff and the pads start swirling all over the place it's the best thing in the world but I will run um, actually I run the vocals through this as well so vocals into the the uh, graphic EQ then it goes into the compressor then it goes into the um, uh, vocoda. You want to DS your vocals pretty hardcore as well. Next, with your pads or your carrier, um, bigger, chunkier, crazier, lots of high end. Run that into the into the um, graphic EQ, and you're going to want to pull out uh, 200 to 400, and basically pull out everything below 100. Um, you might also want to put a bit of a duck at 2, 3K. Man, my internet connection is terrible and I apologize. Um, that goes into your compressor. That goes into your vocoder. Once again, depending on the vocoder, um, it depends on how much uh, input it likes. Um, a f an interesting thing here is that if you distort something going into the vocoder, it w like if you feed it a distorted pad, it actually can be really cool. Distorted vocals, no. Distorted pad, yes. Distorted uh, modulator, no. Distorted carrier, yes. Um, because the, if you distort the carrier, you start really pushing and saturating those higher harmonics. Vocoders want higher harmonics. Um, then uh, mix to your desire with, with the vocoder. Now there's another really cool thing as well, and that's noise. That if you don't have a lot uh, enough um, frequencies going on, throw some noise in there, like white noise. And you might want to sculpt out some of the aforementioned uh, 200, 400, and drop everything below uh, uh, one k, uh, 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 100, and sculpt it out a bit at 3k, 2k. Um, it will really add some sheen to the Varcoda. And uh, mix and stir. So with this in mind, you can then do some really interesting things. And um, for example, that pad sound that's going in, if you start frequency modulating that pad or really adding crazy harmonics. So for example, um, if you can uh, track Mm, that might be too hard. Um, if you start frequency modulating or really um, adding uh, amplitude modulation or anything exciting and crazy to the vocoder, it will sound amazing. If you're running, uh, not using a pad synthesizer like a poly or something and you're using modular or software modular, a nice fun trick is to um, uh, ha have the, the, the root note clear and simple but then have another oscillator that's going crazy on the top and you might even take a, uh, a an envelope generator take the vocal feed it into the envelope generator so the envelope generator is moving with the very slight movement of the vocal because we've compressed the crap out of the vocal you take the output of that <laughs> and that's what's actually pushing something else for example that might be pushing some crazy frequency modulation and it will sound like dope. It will just sound, um, the more mayhem in the vocals, the better. Uh, when I do stuff like that, the verse vocal is a vocoder in the middle, and I want it to sound like my voice is sitting in this big crazy couch, and that couch is the vocoder. And it's got lots of weird crazy frequencies that are bubbling, 
it sounds like they're sitting in behind my vocal cords. So they're there and you can hear them. And if you pull the vocal out, there it is. And there might even be other times when the vocoder speaks and the vocals don't. Then in the chorus, I like the big pads and I'll do two different takes, one pan left, one pan right. Um, so it's big and sexy. Another really fun thing you can do is you can use your voice as the carrier and the modulator. And if you do that, it's really interesting what happens when you compress, distort um, the uh, what's going to become the the, uh, the 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 carrier, the pad voice, as opposed to your original voice. And you're going to get some buzz, really. Oh, ring modulate one and don't ring modulate the other. Um, a lot of other vocoders have a really cool thing where you can take the bands and you can say, well, band 10, uh, uh, 1K band, I'm going to patch that into 500 cycles, where you can actually cross mix the bands. There's actually a really cool vocoder, like it was a modular vocoder, um, where you could do that. And it wasn't hellishly expensive. Um, you can do that on the Dopa, obviously on the Moog. That's what I got, and so much more. Talk to me, what are your thoughts? You didn't even broach ELO on that one. I really thought you were going to go there earlier in the in the in the topic. But um, one of the, the the things you did mention was um, changing the um, band crossovers, um, crossfades between the bands. And if you do something with fewer bands and less crossover, you get less um, fidelity and articulation from the modulator, and you get closer to the robotic style things and that's where some of the more textural stuff comes in and then of course the more bands you use to analyze the modulator the closer to just the modulator's original source you'll you'll get especially if you're putting um noise into it that has equal power at all frequencies you can approach something that's just slightly not the voice but you need like what 64 bands or 32 bands to to start making it sound similar but the um, the original, and I think I think interesting. The the original idea was to cut it into fewer bands so that you could put voice over um, worse connections, longer distance. Oh yeah, and I said AT and T, but I meant Bell Labs. Having looked up what I was actually talking about, um, <laughs> but to, you know, to get something that that used to take up a uh, connection of a pipe. This wide, you just segment the voice into analyzed bands that were a little bit narrow, and you throw away the stuff between them, squash them down, put them through the pipe, and then re-open um, them up on the other end. And one of the things that that led to, that I think this is where it went, is the linear predictive version of that, which I, is the encoding that they use on the speak and spell for the, um, the voice recordings on that. And that's one of the most classic... Um, sounds for people of a certain generation, certainly. Um, and there are some pretty cool emulations of, of, of that, which doesn't require a carrier. It's just, it uses its own, you know, uh, noise sources as that, but it does analyze in the same way and gives you that kind of otherworldly, a little bit robotic, but still human um, voice treatment that we used to get on the cell phones, um, you know, when... when the, the data rates were much more limited on those when they first went to digital. So, I uh, yeah, linear predictive coding is the the voice codec. There's there's three or four different. I think uh, Bitspeak is one of the ones from uh, um, uh, Magnus Lindstrom that has it, and um, any of the the um, plugins that'll do like uh, uh, f film s uh, ed sound editing where you need to simulate phone calls and it'll do like bit rate drops and static interruptions and stuff like that it's a really fun close to vocoder but not quite uh technique that's really interesting um another thing i forgot to mention was uh mm. if you can be putting volume adjustments between the like like between the the carrier and the modulator that really helps because you might want to go through and duck some of the volumes um you know, just to kind of like do a big EQ. FYI, the Dopa's got 
are 13 bands, a high pass and a low pass, so technically 15, or technically 13 bands and a high pass and a low pass. Um, but yes, pulling uh, some of the bands out will achieve something that's more airy and open, and that can be really cool for um, for like making you know big airy pads and stuff. I need to do more of that. And another important thing I think for a Vakoda is to have uh, a dedicated portamento. And I have two Mesotron, um, they're passive portamentos and they're really cheap. Um, and there's four on each one. So I will just decide what band I want to run through the, um, uh, you know, run through it. And if it's a pad, there's more portamento. If it's something percussive like the lead vocals, there's no portamento. And another thing to do is like, like I said, you know, because I'm using hardware, so I've got to print it. Um, when I'm doing the, um, you know, the stereo uh, vocoder, um, I'll go through and I'll, for the left channel will be, you know, set up there might for the pads there might be a bit of portamento here and there then when I come to do the right channel I'll add a bit of portamento to stuff I'll take some away I'll change some of the volumes and I'll also go through and change some of the um, uh, you know change some of the bands so band 16 is going to band 8 band oh no wait band 10 is going to band 5 band 11 is going to band 6 you know what I mean just so they're not going to phase and they're slightly different. And then I want to talk about ELO. But first, here's Ivan. Yeah, so I'm looking and, uh, yeah, I think like a great place to cheaply explore the crap out of vocoding uh, is going to be VCV rack. There are a ton of tools. And yeah, you know, once you've got VCV rack, you know, either install the free version or or get the pro VCV Pro. There's there's so many free VCV uh, vocoder tools that I, it's not even funny. Can you put that in the description? I've never really explored that. That. Uh, and also. Uh... Circle of Tone, thank you so much for your kind uh, comment. I want to talk more about how we can screw up vocals because I need to be inspired. And there's the Super Rock. Hopefully that works. Okay. Um... Fantastic. So, let's talk about Vakoda sounds that we like. Um, Rezzy, you brought up ELO. I don't know what, what he used. I'll assume it was a Roland. I saw a Vakoda from the 50s yesterday. That's great, Alex. I'd love to see that. Why aren't you in the chat? I mean, why aren't you in here now? Rezzy, tell me about your favorite Vakodas and tell me about everything. I don't think I have a favorite. Um, I mean, Mr. Blue Sky ELO, since you mentioned it, is um, an entry point, but it's not one of my favorite songs. I mean, it's a marvel of construction and engineering and creativity, but the vibe is so... Well, yeah, it's... <laughs> um, what? Uh, what? Are you bagging ELO? Are you bagging Mr. Blue Sky? Hesitantly, I mean it's a wonderful song, but is there is there anything in uh, eight eighty two oh four overture? Is there a vocoder in that? Because that one I love, and I, even though I botched the actual title, seventy two oh three forty two oh five. What's the? I look, my baby, I don't know, <laughs> but keep going. I'm sorry, I just s s so side chained you or something. Am I thinking the end of Warlock? Skinny puppy has. Um, The favorite instruments I have, I don't, <laughs> for whatever reason, I'm just, I'm not up to um, speed on, on my, my topics for, for th that particular effect. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to think about it a little bit more while you 
um, <clears throat> talk about your your favorite ELO moments of, of vocoder, which apparently is all in Mr. Blue Sky. Yeah, it's my whole life. Yeah. Hey, can you do me a favor? Because uh, I can't use the internet because my internet is crap. Thanks, Spectrum. Um, can you jump on um, the internet and can you tell me what vocoder they used? I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was... In, oh, that was probably a Moog. Look, I don't know. I'm not going to even guess. Ivan, tell me about your Vakoda moments. Vakoda moments. Uh, I don't know if I've had any, like, many. I, uh, I, I think I think Warlock, I think that there's a Vakoda in there. Have you guys heard of The Faint? Um, you haven't heard of The Faint? Yeah, you have heard of The Faint. Ivan hasn't. Right. Uh, uh, everybody's... Um, bloody homework is to research The Faint. I don't even know if they're still together. God, I hope they are. Specific, specifically their album, Dance Macabre. Um, it's really funny. Vakotas was so not cool, and then Dance Macabre came out, and that album's got the best Vakotas, and I don't even know what they're using. Um, I saw them live twice, and they owned it. Man, they were good. Um, it's a really fat no mechan no messing around chunky fat vocoder um and i'll tell you chunky fat vocoders are really hard really hard to uh to achieve you think it's easy it's like a good moog fat moog sound like a fat moog bass is not easy everybody thinks it's easy it's not you got to work on that thing um yeah so the faint wow Mr. Blue Sky, it's so chunky and and also, um, man, a lot of Jar. I love Jar Vakoda work. He didn't do a lot. It was earlier album stuff. Um, but they're great fun. And they're such a really um, brilliant tool. For example, if you want to use a Vakoda, but you want to, if you want to distort your voice, I've mentioned this before, I did a blip vert on Vakodas. Um, Step one is instead of using a pad, just use noise. And you will get the most evil sounding thing you've ever heard and whisper into it. And it's just hell. It's hell in all sorts of sexy places. Sexy hell. <clears throat> or something. Um, I see Ivan's chair. What do you found, Rezzy? Um, yeah, the, the last... Um chorus of, of Warlock when he when it dumps in on Wasted Truth and he's got the big pad going behind it and it like goes maybe lower octave, upper octave on it. It's it's one of the best moments of vocoding use in, in history and one that I would cite as my actual I wanted to copy that so bad in so many different ways over the years after getting my ears around it. I think it's a perfect use. Cool. What were they using? don't know probably something around the studio i don't know that they they owned one and it probably wasn't software no it definitely wasn't, it wasn't software, software at that time it was way before would have been a plug-in so yeah um find out I guess. somebody find out yeah looking okay uh we can change subject if you like um or we can keep on this one Yeah, I'm. I'm really thinking that I need to, you know, spend some quality time exploring VCV with, you know, for vocoding. Also, I need to install this. What is that? There. Wait. Vocoder. Oh, yeah, this goes in the red. It's what? This is this. This is the part for the red. All right, dude. Dark star. This is the vocoder chip. It will replace the main voice chip. That's exciting. Do it. A thousand times. I used to and, have a... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and, we'll, and it will turn this into a dedicated vocoder with a lot of controls and a sequencer and presets. I, yeah, this is this, this will be perfecto. That would be great. Another fun thing with vocoders is actually run, instead of just a static pad, be running crazy random stuff into it on the 16th or on the 8th and your voice just starts to gurgle. It's really fun. So weird people don't mess with Vakotas, but that's fine. Did we find out what Skinny Puppy used? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. Surgery. Let's change the subject, because I just feel like this is... Not too many people are very interested in Vakotas anymore. 
<laughs> they are. It's just that they're kind of a, they're very niche. Niche. Like niche. and also, like it's one of those you don't want to put too much into your mix. Like you know, unless you're well, you know what? I take that back. You can find ways that are very challenging to use it creatively, all of which were just outlined by Carl. So um, I totally take it back. This there's, is actually there's a million ways to use it forever. A really fun thing about a Vakoda as well is let's say you're one of these people who go, I can't sing and I don't want to try singing. Um, then you do your synthy growly growl voice, but you have a Vakoda behind you that is outlaying the note that you're singing. So you go blah 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 blah, blah. and the vocoder is um, the vocoder is actually playing a melody. So your voice might be there, but the vocoder melody something Manson <coughs> used to do that I loved is he would play a vocoder way Jerry. down low. So low that it was gurgling and he'd sit that right under his voice and it was great. But if you have a little vocoder there doing its thing while you're not singing and it's singing, then that's great. And then when it gets to the chorus, it plays big chords. And that's another really fun thing about I'm um, about vocodas, but I usually end up cutting them out because I overdo it. You can never overdo a vocoda, Randall. Wrong. Um, in the chorus, when you hit the chorus, put in some crazy chords so that you're still not singing, but the vocoda choir is singing around you. And you can be building some absolutely beautiful, huge chords behind you as you talk and you can just create the most wonderful thing and look at that it's a new overlay wow it's the first time this has ever been opened that's great the uh, uh i've got a you know i've got a track that i've been working on since like january the, the, the only thing it needs now is vocals um and it's called uh now i become death and like i really am suddenly very motivated to go vocoder on this one because it wants to be rough and crunchy anyways so why not get it the rest of the way do it another really fun thing about vocoders uh, is um, uh, Randall says uh, hold on I'll get to that in a minute Randall is you know how there's call and response sometimes in your verses the vocoder can be you can still yell your your the whole track, but the second bar the vocoder comes in and it's sitting up under you. And that adds really nice spi spice. And another really fantastic thing is when you're going into the um uh when you're going into the chorus, that's when you start, you know, the pre chorus or the end of the verse, you start bringing in the pads. So it's like the breath before the plunge. Um, uh, hold on, yep, and Diana said we need a music video from you, Ivan, and, uh, yes, uh, Alex, I do agree that it is fantastic, um, Spice, I've always wanted to do a track that's just Vakoda, though, and Randall said another fun, uh, Vakoda mode, uh, Skinny Puppies, hold on, Skinny Puppy, uh, in the chorus of Paragon and its way, uh, the way it's laid is a brilliant and menacing thing. Sorry, Rizzy, go. I, I have a, um, I hesitate to call it a song, but a short piece that was entitled Everybody Writes a Vocoder Song. And I think you can probably imagine the entirety of the piece given the title. Um, it was on the nose. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. Well, this has been fun. What do we want to talk about now? Getting through the backlog. Oh, hold on. Ivan, uh, uh, Rezzy, did you have your hand up then? Or were you going, I don't know what to say? Yeah. Um, I have a couple of things that might not be topics or might be um I, I like maybe what what i've been talking about would be a longer dive into it and i'm always into that it could touch on organization and creativity um but i've had a couple of weeks of searching for um if i may jump in of course um the uh 
<clears throat> solution to my dead um, audio interface. And it was uh, the one that I was formerly using was definitely a digital mixer with no front panel. But it, of course, served the function of getting all of my analog sources into the computer to be recorded. And that was its main purpose. The, the digital mixer function was almost secondary, mm, further from secondary. It was like almost I didn't need it. But what I'm realizing is I've gone from in the 2000s having uh, rack units that were just analog inputs that didn't really do anything but pass through the analog inputs to make them available on USB or Firewire at the time to the DAW, to these boxes that are much cheaper, every bit is good sounding, but have topologies that combine a control section, you know, control room section, and the analogs to USB, and some sort of, maybe there's a history or tradition to this, like Q mixes. I focus right has it in their software. Um, Audient Evo is the one that I ended up buying. They have it in their software where you don't have a channel strip with sends to aux buses. You have pages that are the Q-mix. So if you select your master mix, you've got one mix. You select your Q-mix one, you've got a different mix. And there's no, necessarily even in, in the Audient version of it, there's no automatically do this to all channels, um, all outputs. And there's a weird sort of implied connection between the analog outputs and these Q-mixes. It's not mandatory. You can still route it and, you know, do your, your patching matrix to some extent. But I was just, if I have a question here or maybe something to, to talk about further, like, I'm not sure that I'm happy that it has any of those functions. I think I would much rather still something that passes through a bunch of mic pre's and or analog uh, line level inputs to my DAW, and then I'll do the, you know, mixer functions and busing and routing there if I ever need to, or be removed, you know, not have the ability. I think it adds a layer of accidents and confusion and complexity that's hidden behind pages of Q mixes and stuff that doesn't serve the device terribly well, but would be fantastic for what they show in all the ads. And that's some super cool hipsters hanging around in their amazingly well-appointed loft with extremely expensive uh, 500 series racks of mic pre's and, you know, a person on drums and a person on guitar and then a person at a uh, card table with the uh, laptop set up. And, um, and someone on the roads. I, I can see how it would... Yo, yeah, it's mandatory. Maybe a Wurlitzer if they're really going for it, but there is tons of electromechanical representation going on. Warm lighting, exposed brick. Um, so if it comes down to it, those are really cheap compared to what uh, the other things are. And the ones that tend to pass through multiple analog to digital channels are like Maddie and um, uh, uh, Dante and other either licensed encumbered or expensive versions of getting the digital audio in, and they don't just hook up by a USB anymore or by um, Thunderbolt or Firewire. So I don't know if you all have any specific thoughts um, on that distinction. I, but, I, I, like I've got a, I'm running an audio fuse uh, uh, studio. And one of the things that it's got is ADAT in and out. And, you know, like there are, you know, some, the, actually kind of surprisingly cheap ADAT, IO, you know, or, you know, analog to ADAT devices available out there. One of them made by, you know, some guys that we don't talk about. And um, I think that there's some others made by guys that, that I don't know the name of that we could talk about. But, like, there, there are a bunch of choices out there. And in you, you, this day and age, you know, analog to ADAT, like, it probably doesn't matter who made it just because it's going to, it's all going to be the same, uh, you know, mostly because they, they, they have probably four manufacturers for choices for components to do that. So you just run out of choices fast. Uh, you know, and so like, like if you've got, if you've got ADAT, I, I would say, you know, find one of those and, you know, uh, find yourself with a whole lot more IO. Um, and I think uh, like, uh, ADAT is, is it's just good enough to do the recording with? Um, 
I ended up with an audience. I suppose you pronounce it Evo, not EVO. It's, it's lowercase. So audience Evo 16. Um, it's got another two buses of uh, eight channels of eight at light pipe IO. So I can do 16 extras with that. And it's got eight or 10 um, analog to digitals on board. So plenty, more than enough. I haven't selected a um, second bank analog to light pipe ADAT device yet, but I happen to have an actual Alesis ADAT sitting in the rack. So if I wanted to have something on phono inputs to light pipe, at least I've got that covered. Um, but I'm trying to get away with just using the built-in um, eight inputs on the back and two on the on the front. Um, see if I can just patch bay it for that and, and not bother with a, with a second bank of, of analog to, to digital for now. Um, it, 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 f- mostly for that reason that the mixer is not... I don't want to use it. I don't want to have it on screen. I don't want to have... You know the confusion of accidentally leaving th- stuff sent to a you know a loopback bus for Zoom. Like it's not it's not part of my workflow when I'm writing or recording a song. No, no, I, I think I just assume leave it leave it out. Yeah, you know, when push comes to shove, in the end, my DAW is my mixer. Yeah, you know, that's where I'm doing all of that because it's all in one place and I can just see it. Yeah, you know, whereas like you know having to pull up an extra piece of software and then find screen real estate for it. And the answer is no. The answer is simple. It's, it's just no. It, 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 that's not happening. And I know that the manufacturers would love to believe that that somehow I'm going to give up the DAW to use their little mixer interface that does, well, mixing. And usually not even as well as I'd like it to. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to Unity gain that and, and just use the DAW to like, like handle all the goodies. Interestingly, on this one, there is no mode for just universally ignore the mixer. Other companies that I've used recently, even though they're mixers, there's kind of a recall this just um, vanilla audio interface mode. The audience doesn't quite have that. At least oh. they don't. They don't call it by name. Um, it's it's very much uh, Q mix for your drummer, Q mix for your bassist, um, audio loop back to Zoom and uh, uh, DAW returns. Um, but the, one of the things that's interesting in, in this confusion is there's a bit of namespace ambiguity about what it means to send stuff from the DAW to the interface, which some people are calling it computer returns, some people are calling it DAW, some people are calling it USB returns. Um, yeah, but I it's been a bit of a, a curve getting used to what what they're actually calling it. So you know, spend I, 15 minutes looking at that. I think, especially with with like DAW uh, computer interface mixer. There are a lot of over one. There's a lot of overloaded terms. We're using the same word to talk about three different things, and then also there's there's a problem of we don't know what word describes this yet. So we're going to just make up different stuff for everything, and now you don't know what you're talking about. So it's a labeling problem. <laughs> well, I will say to sort of wrap this one up. Um, I settled on something that I'm pretty happy with. It's not the one that I wanted. I was definitely going to go with Mo2. They've got. Um, one with more analog, unbalanced, non XL or balanced, but not mic prees. And that's what I really wanted. I didn't need the mic prees. I need maybe two. I've got external mic prees for that. Um, but the Motu stuff is all back ordered. Maybe they're coming out with a new revision. Oh, no, no, not available. You know, Motu stuff right now is back ordered forever. And it's been that way for yeah. over a year. Like, I don't know. Wonder. What that, what I just encountered it. I had no idea that was the case. But I, was, I think it's a 1248 or whatever something that was like exactly the number of guitar inputs I wanted on the front and analogs on the back. Yeah, I was like, no, no, that's my interface. It's a very wonderful piece of uh, gear. Uh, they had a, I don't think they're going under, they, they had a new piece of hardware come out recently. Um, you know, and I, I think, you know, they're Motu, they're, they're, people like them. It's just, I think that they, I mean, they're in, they've, they're in some sort of deep, deep doo-doo with, with supply chain situations. Over yeah, in probably. And, yeah. You know, and the result is like, like if it's got uh, uh, their, you know, audio networking, uh, ABB, it's got if it's got that on it, yeah. you can't get it. Game over. You just can't find them, uh, like anywhere. And, and yeah, you know, hey, when ago, they come back, I may I may still get one. Be, but for now, the Audient is beautiful gear. The software is pretty beautifully designed. It's well thought out. Front panel is lovely. Pretty happy with it. So. 
solved for now. I'll be right back. Okay. Sure thing. Um, if I could. Carl, just... what do you use to get get in? Just me, if I could ask. Me? Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. I, I was gonna um, comment on all that. I use a foresight. Uh, uh... Oh, the scarlet. The uh, scarlet. The yeah, the I twenty. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah. I was looking at more um, uh, light pipe options, but then I realized I don't need them. Um, I have everything on a piece of paper here because I'm Carl the Super Anal. I, I have mine in a document that I can call up. Yeah, totally. Um, MIDI layout, and on the other side is the Scarlet. I'm... No, I'm kind of using... No, you know, I'm not. I'm still not using the inputs, and I'm really not using... I'm using half of them. Um, I send a lot of the Scarlet stuff dedicated to the patch base so I can pull stuff out and run it through the modular. Um, and even then, I only send one or maximum two signals. Um, but uh, the only time I've sort of come close to running out of uh, inputs is when I'm using the blaster beam, because I need five inputs, and currently on the Scarlet, I can scam it. I can scam it. I have to finesse things a little bit, but I can scam it. It's very interesting regarding this conversation, which I'd like to chime in on. Um, I'm sure that my Scarlet has all of these features, but I don't use them. And I'm really, uh, I don't mean to be hijacking it, but hey, that's what I do. Um, I am always aware that I am just existing in the 80s. Um, or the early 90s. Like, I just feel that I never got out of that. I won't, uh, and part of the reason is I don't trust computers. Like, um, this computer is going to fuck up and it's going to get in the way of my production, composition and everything else. And what you're saying is important. And if you've got a strong knowledge of computers or a relative knowledge, mine isn't. It's crap. Um, I've got an audio card over there I've been needing to put in this computer for two years. And I apologize to Brett again from the Demon Hate. I still haven't done it. Um, because, frankly, I'm scared. I'm scared I'm going to fuck something up. Um, but I, um, like, you know, my whole thing about a computer is if it works, don't touch it. Um, because if it goes wrong, I don't know how to fix it. I'm lucky I have a lot of friends who do, and I've called on you guys so many times. We all call on each other, and that's great. We've got to keep doing that. But the other thing is, I don't have the time. Um, because my monitor busted this week, and sure, I've got COVID and everything, but it's like, dude, I've got to get shit done. And my, because my, my monitor died on me. I got a new one. Um, uh, it, that cost me th like three days of rolling out. I've got to roll out the new album. I've got to roll out the artwork. I've got to get on top of these tracks. I'm doing stuff for all of... Da -da -da -da. I've got two remixes on my plate. And it's like... Um, but I guess that's my thing Is I'm trying to say is that I need to push myself to utilize stuff more. And yet... Um, it's really important that as much of my stuff as possible is doorless um, because I'm always like the other day I fired up the K2000 god damn I love that sampler um, don't let the Emaxes hear me say that because they get jealous um, you know what they're like uh, and it was like just fucked around over there and over there no doors no nothing nothing's going through anything it's all analog except the fucking Yamaha 01V which is so old it might as well be analog um, so I had a bloody good time I, I, that's my problem with this shit and it's really good that it works um, and uh, I think what you say is important and I just so sidechained the whole thing I see your hand and it's a beautiful hand you should be I a hand model on from this. sorry go ahead Oh my God! <laughs> don't don't meme that. Um, I've been just in case to put a, a fine point on, on on the discussion of my particular audio interface. Do you have a um, eight at light pipe rack space device that doesn't have mic pre's? Is there a Me? sixteen with two pipes? Yeah, my my uh, my yeah my audio. Uh, wait wait wait. When, when... My expert sleepers, uh, eight at, eight at, two euro rack, stuff. 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just okay. why I originally got, got aid at was because I wanted to be able to, like, not screw around. From okay, can I ask you, how many how many in and outs on Carl? that expert, expert sleeper? A lot. Are we talking eight? Or are we talking 16 uh, in and out? Yeah, no, no, and, and I, I think it, I think it might, it, it's, it's a huge interface. I think it's got, I, I think it ends up being like eight and eight, uh, or, or 16 and eight. There's a lot. It's very, yeah, they go in group banks well. of eight on eight ad. <laughs> Shit. Yeah, it's a, it's a great interface. Is that the ES3? Um, I've got the, I've got the ES3 and I've also got the light pipe and like, I'm apparently an expert sleepers junkie, so like we had, if they make it, I've probably got it. Just let's just put it that way. That's good to know. That's really good to know because if I hadn't, I, and, so and 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 they are they uh, uh, three point five mil jacks or are they quarter inch? Are they eighth inch or quarter inch? Are they I, don't you I dare say I think that. you should know what they are, Ivan. I cannot remember off the top of my head. I'd have to. I haven't, I'd have to go look at the Euro rack to, to like to see. How far and is the Euro rack? It's like two rooms away, and I, I don't. I'm not keeping it in here right now because I have run out of freaking space, and I haven't been. You know, I haven't been doing anything with the Euro rack for for a while. So how long's a while? Probably three months. Yeah, I know. I know. No, that's actually, yeah. this is another question I want to ask. That's interesting. I want to know also, how long do you go without touching your gear? That sounded rude. Um, oh, uh, no. No, but, no, but, but hold on, I want to finish really... up this conversation first. Thank you very much about the uh, thing. That's interesting. Does anyone want to throw in here? I do want to also talk about Ivan's thing. Uh, I just railroaded ro ro everything. Do we want to go back to that conversation <laughs> and finish it? Because we're polite. No, this is cool. I, I hadn't been looking for uh, Eurorack or 500-ish modules at all, so this opens up a whole bad, bad new path to, to look for stuff. Thanks, Ivan. Um, You're welcome. How, um, how, how often do you, like, how long do you go without touching your modular? Uh, three months is usually the tops I'll go tops so we're and, talking a week then three months a week then three months or oh no for six months then uh, once, yeah yeah once it's plugged in it's going to be there for a while just because moving things around is a giant pain in the ass right now uh and as far like the rest of my gear like with the hydro synth and the system eight like i i i mess with those every single day really right by the door to my room wow. i play them as i go in and out you know, just because I can, you know, and like I've, I've made patches that took an entire day to make one patch just because, you know, every time I walk past it, I would mess with it just a little more. So you leave it on? Oh, yeah, all day. Wow. Do you turn it off at night or you leave it off at the night too? Um, no, it, it will get turned off overnight. You know, sometimes it'll get, it'll just stay on. You know. Wow. Because they, they, they draw practically nothing. You know, they don't really cost, in, you know, they don't cost enough to run to, to think about it. Wow. Razzy, do you want to chime in on this? No, I don't have a modular synth. Well, I'm about what about to regular synth? Sleepers customer. <laughs> um, I sometimes leave my hands off the um, actual synths in my room for months at a time. I'm not, um, not always in... in creating tones mode but it's not that they're ever unplugged or you know come out of the system they're they're always you know just a, a, a launch my audio app and start jamming away but um you like i usually go to i mean it's just not exciting to talk about software sense so like they're they're just always there yeah. like my default open up my bfw <laughs> has more synthesizer power than I could have dreamed of, you know, cumul in in other, you know, studio formats. Um, so it's it's, you know, embarrassment of riches. It's just it's a, it's hard to to make um, the leap outside of the box when I know that thing's not going to recall and I've got to just hit record and do some stuff. Um, but I, I, I 
think to expand it just a little bit more and maybe answer the, the, the spirit of the question in earnest, I cycle through most of the gear. I can go a couple of months without playing bass and then really regret it because my calluses are gone and I get a RSI from plucking the strings intensely for, uh, you know, three days to try to get a part down. Um, guitar, not usually so much. Those are everywhere around the place, so I pick them up frequently. Um, and singing, I tend to neglect when I'm not writing stuff, like well, being a not a uh, car owner, I don't have the sitting in the car in traffic singing along with stuff. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, those are the three big areas, vocals, bass, guitar, synths. They, but they, you know, they, they cycle. They're on like a yeah, rolling yeah. schedule. One supplants the other is my favorite thing. Yeah. If I had a drum kit, that would be like the other thing. But I, one of the shortcomings in my life is not having a... Um, Tony, uh, exposed brick, warmly lit hipster loft with uh, space for a, a drum kit and no neighbors. So. And a Wurlitzer and a $20,000 coffee machine and a friend named Evan. Oh, my God. Um, and a beret. Oh, no. What, what's the neck thing called? Cravat. A cravat. Say again? A cravat. A cravat. Oh, right. Cravat, um. Yeah. I haven't used my blaster beam in six months, which I'm pissy about. I didn't use my K2000 in maybe a year, except the other day. My new album, I'm wanting to push the K2000 really hard because I have to. I haven't used the Emulator 4 in 18 months. It has not been turned on in 18 months. It's one of the most beautiful fucking synthesizers I've ever heard, and I haven't fucking turned it on because it's a pain in the cock. It's a pain in the dick to one program. Hate it. Yep. Kind of similar to the K2000. But, you know, it's funny with the K2000, I will sit on that thing and program it. Like, I'll go, yeah, let's program this thing. I think I need to get a new fucking OLED. Um, my modular, I'm same with you, Ivan. Like, I'll use it like crazy, and then for three months I don't touch the thing. Um, that's why I can't justify buying more gear. Um, something I have noticed is that when I go into the production phase of a song, and I actually log my hours on this stuff, when I'm in production mode of a song, that takes the most time. And a lot of that time is spent fixing up the mistakes that should have been fixed when I had the synthesizers going. Because I go into throwing everything down on synthesizers mode, then I go into production mode. And the bummer with a modular is that you can only do one song at a time. You've got to dedicate it, then you've got to get it out. The good thing about samplers and modern stuff is that there are presets. So, butter, butter, butter. And for me, having two patches going simultaneously is really hard. Because my brain is... I'm not the smartest guy in the block. Anyway. Um, and a beret, thank you. Um, so, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make that time of spending stuff on the synthesizers longer because it's fun. Um, and you're going to get more cool stuff done. And here's something really interesting is that I was listening back to stuff that I did a long time ago. I'm talking very early Angel Spit slash pre Angel Spit. And because the door recording technology wasn't as good you had to do all the bells whistles and tricks in the sequence <coughs> and sometimes no i always think that i've got more lazy um and that's something that really concerns me as a dude that does music i don't want to say producer because it sounds like a wank i've got definitely more lazy and um, uh, I need to fix that by not being lazy anymore. Uh, I'm Carl Lemont. More news after this break. <laughs> um, that's all yeah, I no, got. I've got. Has anybody I've else? Got, I've got a giant wire rack in the corner loaded with equipment. And depending on, depending on where things are headed, What's on the 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 keyboard stand? We'll swap out with that, you know, back and forth, almost semi frequently. Um, you know, it's like uh, like all of the all the stuff for the band um, has been me proving 
me proving that that I should just get a tattoo, you know, Roland for for life on my back and just you know call it a day. Um, but uh, next uh, batch of of stuff we're writing is I am going like Corgam one. Uh, you know, Korg, Korg, Korg. It, it, is, it is my. It, it's a love letter to Korg, just to remind them that I, I like them too. Also, it's it, a different sound, so it's 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 a bit spikier. The sounds that yeah. I'm using in this one. So we're headed like for this batch. We're headed in more of a click click direction. Good on you. Yeah, know, like bent massive and yeah, you because know, like. Like nobody's doing that right now, and and it sounds really good. Um. It, but at the same time, like I've got, I have my my nineteen inch rack mount equipment collection, which is only growing. But since the freaking third floor is not freaking done yet, I don't have a place to put it, and and actually use it at the same time. So it's kind of just sitting in storage until third floor gets done. And you know, this is all about the pain of third floor not being done yet. Uh, after I uh, wait, wait. The more you know. <laughs> That's yeah. Um, I'm with you. Uh, Adam Bomb just made a really cool comment about redundant gear. Um, redundant gear, man, it's great. So I want to throw two questions at you. The first one is, um, how often do you move your gear around? And the second question is, when you go into an album. Um, uh, how often do you say I want this album to sound like here's the palette of sounds and paints that I want to be using on this album so the first question how often do you move your studio around that is uh, uh, you know every six to eight weeks you know there'll be something that gets moved, gets moved around you know it's almost guaranteed um, and then and then the answer to like like new album equals like this palette of sounds it's kind of the answer is yes because like like you know i want i want that to be kind of you know vaguely cohesive um you know and recognizable is where where it came from it, where where in my cycle did that come from and you know by changing out the swapping out the gear to like really kind of showcase you know certain items in the collection uh, you know, the, does a great job of, of of really you know getting me across the across the finish line there. Um, so you know, like all the all the stuff that that's brand new that that's that's going in our next batch, it's 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 so Korg, it's not even funny. Um, please keep know, going. The last batch, which was so rolled. Uh, please it, it was, keep talking great. about this. I think I've got a, a cat issue to deal with. I'm just going to run away for a second, but please keep going. I'll be back in three seconds. You know, and we've got that. You know, vocalist has vocal like 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 songs written. You know, like <laughs> vocals. You know, for a third album, and when we get there, I am absolutely convinced that that's going to be like crazy sauce, like mostly Euro rack and glitchy AF, and you know, made out of screams and terror, just because you know. Like so much of our stuff has been, you know, kind of like first, first, you know, all the stuff in the current project is, you know, really, really influenced by, you know, Thrill Kill Cult and kind of it's, you know, uh, as we keep saying, it's witch house, but more witch, more house. <laughs> I'm going to jump in and answer the question about how often I've um, I think the wording was moved the studio around which is there's 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 two completely opposing answers and in the first case never like I've had the same desk that I sit at for decades and the same general stuff goes on it but stuff I'll say comes and goes so things get bumped in and out um, but one of the things that I always do in the setup is you can get around the back of the main console so that there's room to walk around and rewire. And usually all the 
computers and things with fans like drive enclosures and PCI um, breakout boxes go back there. Um, and I also have like a machine closet nearby so that I can get stuff into that if they're really loud. Nothing's in it right now. I have all quiet gear because that's the way things are going. Um, but the fact that I can walk around the back doesn't mean that it stays neat. It just means that I can drag a cable around the back and leave it there for six months and forget about it. And then eventually realize I'm all out of long USB cables and long XLRs and have to unweave the tapestry that is the loom of cables that have accumulated back there. But it makes it fairly easy to do that. Just turn the lights up real bright and look at the rat's nest and start pulling stuff. And that's a good once a year. I'll end up doing a, a really like time-consuming refactoring of unplugging stuff and replugging it and finding out all the connections that are not used anymore but the layout of the studio itself doesn't really change i've got a pair of 19 inch racks on either side i've got the displays i've got the speakers and i've got the you know synth controller and stuff and they all kind of stay pretty much where they are and i've always um things that need to be reachable so i can operate them just stay close by so that sort of dictates how things get laid out um the, the, the most recent change is, is pulling out an audio interface that had a lot more interconnects and moving to an interface that has a lot fewer interconnects. So I suspect I'm going to rewire the patch bay and relabel it and take, um, you know, make some changes based on that, which will be, again, pulling out interconnects that aren't used and turning them into patch points or, you know, it's not a dramatic change, though. It's just, you know, little small things like that. Um, and before that, I think the last thing I did was, yeah, I swapped out um, the central, so the computer that that was, everything was connected to for something. You know, this was, but it's you know just USB cables. It's not it's not even that dramatic. Um, so when you go into a track, and sorry if you've already covered this one, um, now that's really interesting. I don't move stuff at all. Um, God, I'm. I think my mind is really hard set here. Um, I don't move stuff at all because it's hard to. I don't really have a lot of room. Everything is patched into everything else. Um, behind here is a fucking nightmare. Um, it's the most awful, terrifying thing you've seen in your life. It's horrifying. Um, yeah. Uh. I wish I could. God damn it. Like, the other day, I just wanted to grab a synth, take it outside, sit down and play. But I didn't, because there were just too many cables in the back, and I just went, ah, oh, fuck it. Um, so, my next question... Also, just before I do, um, Randall, yeah, uh, Adam Bomb said that every guitar's got a song in it. I absolutely agree. Same with every synth. Milk them out. They got several songs, um, and and really throw yourself into that sub uh, harmonicon Moog thing because it's fucking amazing. Um, focus on the song first. Get the song strong. Get the parts of the song. And I'm saying this to you, Randall, because you're a songwriter. Everything strong, chord strong, parts strong, vocal lines strong. Then pull in all of this other stuff to add the spice to it. <coughs> you're kind of like. You're building a robot, and all the songs and the, the melodies and the chords and shit. That's all the internal workings, but the synths. That's the um. That's the skinning of it. And Ivan, I can still hear me because this question is statement is slightly aimed at you, and it's also leading into your previous question about how do you deal with the backlog, which um I do want to talk about. If not now, then definitely soon, because that's a big one. Is when you're attacking a new album. Do you sit down and go, I have an album mindset to this? If so, what is it? How is it? Tell me the culture of how you work from album to album. Um, I do. Tell me. Um, <clears throat> I think it's a little bit of a traditionalist approach. I've definitely had a few singles in me. and um, I, I always preface this kind of stuff with how slowly I tend to release stuff and how infrequently I put stuff out. But I'll have some some sort of idea occasionally every few years that's like an in-between projects thing. And it's like, I can just get this out now and then finish it and, and 
just a standalone single song. But I definitely approach music as a collection of songs that go together on an album. And I tried one of the things that was holding me up this past couple of years that I've been finishing, finishing, finishing the latest work is I decided it was all singles because who cares about albums decided I got it in my head that this should be all singles because albums don't matter. And welcome to the modern world. Well, yeah, but there's there's a, a real diverging path between how to do that and how to release stuff in the way an indie label or major label does that all the groundwork is laid out for. And uh, there's a conflict and some tension between the, the, the art and creativity and the way the commerce works. And I found myself not being able to think it through how to turn this into single releases. I have 10 songs done. And then I'm going to do 10 singles for the rest of the year or two years. It didn't come together. I, I found it counterintuitive and the support systems that were, uh, you know, in place for how to release a single 2023, 2024 um, didn't, didn't really square with, with what I was trying to do. So I've gone back to the idea of, yeah, well, obviously it's an album and you do an album release cycle and things that are on the digital distribution are listed under albums and the DSPs list stuff under albums, no matter what. And the album is the album and conceptually that sort of collection represents a time in your life, in your creative, um, uh, you know, pr pr productivity in, in, in your work. And so even if you're not thinking of it as I'm going to create these songs with one, um, you know, heading, one rubric that, that says what they're about or what the style is, you're still marking time and, and, and life and development as, as, a, as a person and, and creative. So there's, there's something automatically useful about that collection. And to take that to, to where I fit into it, yeah, I mean, I definitely think these things should hang together and making a good playlist of the songs and putting them in track order and having some of them crossfade into each other and having related motifs or themes or something. Um, <clears throat> you know, the self-referential pieces of, of, of music in, in the tracks, like all that stuff is so rich and, and interesting to, to, to work on it. It may get lost more likely to get lost if you release these things separately and never collect them under one, you know, one folio. So albums. Yeah. I think of them as albums. I still do. I always have. And as hard as I've tried to work with them as individual pieces, it feels still to me like, I worked on these together. They're an album. All right, cool. Ivan? Um, my lit? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, with the, uh, you know, for band, we've got, uh, we're, you know, we've, we've got an album's worth of, of work right now. Uh, and we're going to be releasing those, you know, month by month, song by song at a time from, you know, month by month. And then at the end, release, you know, a full collection that is, is the album. Meanwhile, like, you know, while we're doing that, we're going to probably be playing some live shows and everything that's, that's you know, in that will get played at a live show. Uh, you know, so people will be hearing things that they can't get yet. You know, and I'm, I'm very okay with that, uh, you know, give them something to be excited about, you know, down the road. Awesome. So do you go in and do you say, um, this album is going to be, I'm going to focus on these synthesizers, on this timeline, on this period of time. Because you know how John Fox said, uh, he, he, he did a, an album and he said it's going to be about a man, a woman, a city. Yeah, no, and, and I think that that is a... Uh, Eight yeah, tracks, exactly no more. Money. Every track, only eight tracks. As in, there's only eight tracks going on in each song. Sorry, Ivan, I just walked over you. Go. Yeah, no, and and uh, that is pretty much exactly what I'm what I'm doing. Is you know, I've gotten very, uh, you know, for this collection of songs that is this, you know, album, currently unnamed album, uh, you know, like I am going back to a lot of the same you know, 
sources for all of this all the songs you know so like you know if it wasn't for roland cloud this you know none of these songs would exist because like like all of the kicks come from one place rolling cloud you know all of the all the leads come from one place rolling cloud um uh, you know and then it's it's you know like every song is gonna have you know there's gonna be a jupiter on there there is gonna be a a, a nice chorusy um uh, you know juno 106 on there um uh, you know and then I've got so many choices after that that all bets are off. I mean, maybe it'll be System Eight or you know something, something, something. Um, but it, it's 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 all gonna you know Roland is is always gonna be number one because that's really the sound of this album is you know that like kind of like mid late eighties you know Roland industrial. That sounds great. Mid late eighties Roland industrial sort of sound. Do you have any Roland samplers? What samplers do you use, Ivan? Ivan? Oh well, I mean, I've got, I've got the ESI thirty two, you know. It's yes. My sampler. Yes, and then, you do. Uh, I'm using. Yeah, and and you know, I I I loves it, and then uh, I'm using the Arturia. Uh, which one? Which one? And I like it a lot because it sounds so good. It is the Arturia. Let me scroll through here. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, is that the is that the CMI? No, no. Which one is it? I'm using one of the Arturia, you know, like like uh, Emu, you know, VSTs. Right. I think they've got an emulator too. Near as I can tell. It. Yeah, yeah, and near as I can tell, it's it it sounds it, it sounds you know crunchy and old school, and, and it's awesome, and I like it. I like it a lot. I mean, you know, you know one song that that it is very prominent on, just because like I could not do that with anything that said Roland on it. Yeah, um, I uh, what about you, Resi? Do you like, you know, know what I mean? I do know. Um, Yamaha 16, TX 16W for crunchy, gritty stuff that doesn't interpolate when you transpose and resample, and also stereo with the Typhoon software, Magnus Lindstrom again, second name check for this uh, show. Um, it's impossible to use, but it does speak MIDI SDS, and you can integrate it with your system. It's pretty cool. And then um, <clears throat> Akai S950, because that's what all my SideQuest storage is on. So And they're great for um, drums. Most... Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. Um, it, it's also the 12-bit 12, 12 sampler, different sound, interpolation for when you transpose, completely different thing. Um, formerly S1000 also, uh, but that was too fancy, so I don't have it anymore. But day-to-day, -day, of course, it's Ableton Live, simpler and sampler. Um, although it stopped loading Akai Banks at some revision, and I didn't even notice but um yeah i can't just drag in um uh a kai formatted uh, cd banks anymore so i'm uh, not sure what's going on with that sound font do I you guess. um uh do you when you use a sampler we're talking about samplers um do you use them for pads do you use them for drums what do you use them bass what do you use them for all of the above everything drums. right okay just Traditionally, drums and longer loops and resampling speech um, snippets back in the day, which uh, you know they haven't really been focusing so much on that because you can dial in a bit reduction thing that sounds incredibly similar on the fly in real time. But um, most of traditionally what I used a sampler for in past tense was drum collections before multi-miked incredibly detailed velocity layered drum kit instruments came out under um, mostly native instruments, uh, you know, standalones. Um, I had uh, like Bob Clear Mountain's drum collection on that thing. And also um, to a lesser extent, some of the East West gold strings I, on the S1000, but there's this like divide when when Giga Sampler B1000 
became the thing and everybody was doing these just really key switched multi sample articulation libraries rather than just like cello 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 kind of sounds um i didn't i didn't really make that that jump on hardware so my stuff hardware samplers are stuck on like one shot drums and you know hey that's a really cool thumb slap on the bass that i'm transposing and stretching and stuff not not too fancy um sampler library stuff where it's um complicated multi-mic strings or drums is usually an instrument of some sort but uh yeah that's that's sort of the divide i um ivan what about you man uh for me samplers are you know that's that's profound sounds you know that that that's for the weird stuff you know like all the way uh you know, I will, uh, you know, dump uh, uh, Reverend Jim Jones quotes into that with reckless abandon. Um, I will dump Tipper Gore, Tipper Gore saying anal sex with reckless abandon. I will, you know, uh, dump uh, Al Gore talking about bondage with reckless abandon because, you know, like, and, and, you know, you know what I would really like? It would be, you know, because, like, you know, just thinking out loud, hey, guys at Korg. Um, Following anal use... sex and and uh, and uh, and Dr. Jones, I have no idea what you would really like. <laughs> There's uh, nothing wrong with anal really sex like and Dr. For, Jones, you know, by the way. I'm all about uh, Reverend oh, Jones, Jim, I should say. Jim Jones was evil. He was evil. Yes, like, he was. Like, Sandra Butts. Yeah, the, the definition of, but uh, you know, Cork has got that uh, uh, a Raspberry Pot Pi platform for creating new synths, and the Pi can handle like making sample or without even trying. What would be nice is if they made a, you know, on that platform, a a, a representation of kind of old school sampling, you know, I think they like did. a like an emu, because you know they did, and then uh, and then hundred... run that through. Sorry, listening. And then run that through analog filters. Yeah. You know, like put some analog filters on there to, to do it through that. And then kind of, you know, kind of like really kind of like make a modern version of doing that. And on it, you can have a knob that just lets you set the bit depth, you know, right there. Just you. Yeah. And it would know, be really cool down, if that knob just right, said 1986, 1984. Yeah. Um. It would be. A sweet piece of hard. I'd, I'd pay seven hundred bucks for that. No problem. I, uh, um, I, uh, yeah. For, for, for me, samplers are. Um, I want the sampler to sound like. Oh, that guy's got an old sampler. I don't want it to sound real. Um, although I have used samplers in the past to make stuff sound real, like I'll record banging something three different times. Uh, soft, hard, uh, medium and hard and, and use that accordingly and, you know, but you know, I've got the Emulator 2 uh, samples that ended up being the Seinfeld bass and I use them all the time in Angel Spit because they're awesome um, Bring Back Slap Bass a thousand times I need to have a t-shirt that says Bring Back Slap Bass, oh yeah um I, uh, for me, the really big um, holy grail for a sampler is creating something that is uh, a huge, sorry, I'm just, everything just fell apart for a second here. Um, creating something that is a massive soundscape. Um, and, um, that, that to me is something that I've always uh, tried to... It may have been because my first memory of walking into a music shop when I was like 14 and they had a, um, an Emacs... 15. They had an Emacs on the, on the floor. And it was, the, it was love at first sight. It was the most strangely grotesque thing I've ever seen in my life. Most big, beautiful, weird fucking thing. And I remember the sound on it was this um, two-layered sound that was just stunning. 
where something came in slowly and then very gently modulated and then this other sound came in behind it and when you took your fingers off um because you can change the uh the the the, the loop release um the loop release came something else another part of the sound that was behind that sound yes Oh, it was just, and that then faded away. And as the oscillators also faded, as the VC, as the filter also dropped down. And it was just this moment in my brain. And that's why I love the great thing about the emulator four is that, you know, you can do all that stuff um, as well. But uh, for, for me, samplers are a achieving that level of just stunning otherworldly sound design of, of here is me scraping something across something and I found this like fragment and and um and I'm looping that and butter 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 and then something else happens when you let the keys go. Um and then trying to create music that has whole a hole in it enough for you to actually hear that. That's the challenge for me. Um but yeah I um you know, the, the plucking strings and winding them backwards, you know, the simple things like that and turning that into this beautiful atmosphere of creepiness. Um, that's why you just can't beat a sampler to me. Um, you know, it's funny, actually, I, uh, you know, when I'm working, doing podcasts and stuff, I often get um, grabs of really nice pieces of orchestral opera and stuff and I'll take a fragment just a tiny fragment a tiny moment and I always use the Kurtzwell for this because the Kurtzwell is looping loops backwards and forwards at pendulum loops um, and they make the most delicious uh, clouds of color that you can just hang in there that create something perfectly dark really beautiful um yeah um i don't sample vocals though um i do sample my own vocals and the kurtzwell is good fun because like obviously the emx is good because you can drop them down and they just sound gurgle and they're beautiful but the kurtzwell is amazing because you can also modulate it with like the the wave shaping and all that stuff it's just beautiful and that's something I want to get back into because I I think I'm slack I used to spend so much time sound designing but then I got lazy and slack yeah that's it that's all I got do we want to talk about I mean we can talk about something else or we can write to MTV TV to find our new favorite band or we can talk about how to deal with, um, what is this Google Drive, Ivan, you just sent? That is the thing that I need to add vocals to most urgently. Okay. Uh, uh, it, I, using, I'm using samples all over the place on that one. Okay, cool. Um, it's really funny, actually, on that, uh, like with um, 6 6 Botnik's Love Missile 1, F111 when they first released it which is the greatest bloody love that track fucking Fairlight I love that whole album that, yeah. that album is great yeah but the funny thing about that track is it's full of the original version was full of samples from everyone like they sampled everything and then they had to re-release it with some guy just saying the samples <laughs> um, because they 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 as soon as sampling came out they went nah we're not going to let you do that so they had to pull all that shit out 6 6 Sputnik man what a band very inspiring band um do we want to talk about getting through the backlog or do we because I've got it there as the first you know we could start with this one next week because it's yeah. such a big topic yeah. it, 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 well, I mean it, this is a uh... Maybe it's this week. Maybe it's the next week. Uh, what I've got is like we've got uh, we've got main band. So there's the band I'm in, and we've you know we're, we're hitting up against you know we, we're to the point where we're you know practice is essentially us going and playing through the set, 
and we're getting ready to, you know, like finalize, you know, the live keyboard and the live, uh, you know, guitar. And then, you know, it's going to be off studio to get, you know, all of the vocals tracked. And then, you know, and then it'll be time to ship it out to get it mastered and start doing the releases, which is great. But then, you know, like on top of that, I've got uh, side projects, uh, you know, where I'm, you know, doing stuff that I want to do for me. And, um, you know, like it was supposed to just be a little fun side thing, you know, and I, would, I was going to, like the goal was to get these started, finished and released as quickly as possible. No, no, no. I, you know, I'm already like, I've, I've got like five songs there already that, you know, like I just need to get through backing the freaking vocals and then get them ready for you know, like mastering or releasing and uh, dragging my feet for some reason. And, you know, uh, the Destroyer of Worlds is one of the tracks for that. And it's so close to ready. I just need to like that, that last bit. I just need to get over. And that, that's what the backlog is. I've got, I'm piling up with stuff that's just like that far from release. And, you know, I just need to get through it. So it might be a good subject for next week. I think it sounds like a great subject. Um, and and it, it also goes into like, how do you store them? How do you, you know, there's a, this is a big con. So, so let's talk about that next week. I love it. Um, did you guys want to bring up anything else, or I'm going to raid Tim's VTV because Diana can't today. But unless we want to talk about something else, amazing. Nothing. Nothing. I think we're good. I guess we need to start getting ready. We're heading up to Chicago to see the cure tonight. Okay. Well, my love to Robert. Um. Uh, 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 I hope that it goes well and I want to thank you all for joining us here now remember every week Art of Rock there right here on Angel Spitz Twitch um, if you got a couple of monks of bu uh, <laughs> bucks a month throw it my way to the Patreon I'd really appreciate it that's there and also, the album is kickstarting now, and there's a whole bunch of stuff on the Kickstarter that will not be available once the al album is released. There. Go help me out. The album will give you nightmares. I'm proud of them, nightmares. Everyone needs nightmares. I think people need my nightmares because they're good. But right now, we're going to go over to MTV TV because it's bloody amazing. Bam! Hopefully that's starting the raid. And if it doesn't start the raid, everybody else on Twitch and Twitter and everywhere else, uh, we are going over. Man, my computer is just hating today so much. It's going, nah, I don't want to help you out at all. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, okay. Man. Ah, oh, this is great. This is like pulling teeth, like quite literally. Boom. If you're watching on another platform, we're going to MTV TV. So thank you so much. You are amazing. And we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Bye.